Half Production. The creators of this podcast would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which it is recorded. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the first storytellers of this land. We pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, as well as any Indigenous people who may be listening today. Hello and welcome to Two Guys, One Urn, I think we're calling this. It's not a really perfect title, I've got to be honest with you, because this is a cricket version of my AFL-adjacent podcast, Two Guys, One Cup, where I am going to talk to people about another sport that I am super passionate about. People will know that I love cricket. Um, I was completely obsessed earlier in the year with Australia's Tour of India, uh, Australia's Test Tour of India, and I... I uh, think I didn't miss a, a ball that was bowled in that entire test to her and really re-energised the fact that I'm like, you know what, I love watching large bits of test cricket in a row, like entire days of test cricket. And if you're the sort of person who loves entire days of test cricket, then the next couple of months have got some pretty special stuff in store for you because Australia is about to play in the World Test Championships. Uh, the And then, of course, the Ashes against England who have had an incredible last couple of years, uh, which we will talk all about. With today's guest, uh, you will know who today's guest is already because, of course, you will have downloaded this episode. His name will have been on it. There might have even been some piece of art. There's, it's rare that somebody actually stumbles on in the middle of a podcast and doesn't know what's going on or who the guest's going to be, but it's very polite to introduce someone at the start of the episode anyway. So you might know him from his super successful podcast, The Howie Games. You might know him for his work commentating cricket and football all over the place. I've known him for nearly four decades. Uh, He is one of my oldest friends and it is a great pleasure to have him on the very first episode of this little project that I'm embarking on for the next couple of months. Uh, Welcome, Mark Howard. Hello, Howie. Will, I'm pumped to see you. I am excited to talk about cricket, as I, you know, because it's just like we were 13 again um, at your house yes. in Hayfield talking <laughs> about cricket. It's funny you said about the India series, mate. I was encapsulated by it as well. Just to take you and other people behind the scenes in what happens when you're travelling around commentating cricket, I think it was the last test of the Australian summer against South Africa. And Mark Waugh said, oh, mate, I've got a gig for the first two tests commentating in India. So we're all about the game and enjoying the game, Will. But the first thing I said to him, now, Junior, Australia versus India, are you getting paid per day or per test? He said, (laughs) now, come on. This is not my first rodeo, Howie. I'm getting paid per test. So when tests run two and a half days and people are saying, well, this is shambolic, there's too much in the deck, every commentator out there is going, I'm getting paid day four, I'm getting paid day five, and I've got my feet up. So well done to Junior and his manager for understanding they weren't going to run the five days of those test matches. That that's that's the ultimate bonus, isn't it? Like I mean, because not only are you getting paid for those extra days, so essentially they're work days, they're getting paid days regardless. And you're in India where your dollar goes a little further when it ordinarily would have. So these are good times. The great Shane Warne, uh, Will, I've never seen anyone get more excited about Boxing Day tests than Warney because, you know, he'd spend his whole time saying it's going to rain in Sydney. We'd get to Sydney and he, he'd put on Insta stories pictures of the Melbourne weather for seven days. It was 32 and (laughs) Sydney, it's going to rain. He loved the Boxing Day test more than anyone I've known. And he'd be that excited about it and it'd be a big build up and he'd do the voiceover and the big lead in and his hour beforehand, he'd be like, hey, this is the best day of the year. It's better than Christmas. You do the first stint with him and after the first stint, the first thing he'd say, you know what, H? this could finish halfway through day three. And I'm like, mate, you've just spent two days building this up as the greatest cricket event ever, and now you want it to finish. So that, that was the way Warney approached it as well. Uh, but take, talk to me. Let, what a, let's just start with Warney because interesting guy, Shane Warne, because like such an iconic, I mean, one of the probably top five you know, if not the greatest cricketer of all time. Certainly in my lifetime, still that idea of as soon as Shane Warren would get the ball ball and go to bowl, like, you know, just people would gather around the television, you know. If you were at the game, all you wanted was for Warney to bowl. And I still, you know, to this day, despite having seen some of the best bowlers and batsmen in the world play in the last 20, 30 years as I've been watching cricket seriously, 
there's just been nobody like him. And he was such a larger than life character. He lived his life in a way that was unapologetically the way that he wanted to live his life. And that wasn't, you know, how everybody wanted him to live his life. And it's certainly not how everybody would choose to live their own lives. And Look, I had a very funny relationship with Shane, which was I never knew him, obviously, early on in the days. I knew him as a kid, you know, watching him play cricket, just being captivated by how good a cricketer he was. And then, of course, I started being a comedian in the period of time where the scandals started to happen. (laughs) So predominantly, I knew Shane Warne as a punchline for a very long time. My first couple of books, I remember a friend of mine in America read both of the books and they were like, who's this Shane Warne fella? (laughs) He's getting mentioned. (laughs) And, And then eventually I got to know him just a little through some media commitments and things that I had where he would come in and, you know, you'd be in the same studio as him and get to have a chat with him and found him to be an incredibly charming person and um, very aware of the fact that you'd made plenty of jokes about him in the past. But, you know, I always admire somebody who's both aware of that and seemingly cool enough with that, you know, in their interactions with you. But but you knew you got to know him a, a lot better than I ever got to know him. Can you give us a little insight into what it was like to – I mean, use Warney maybe even as an example because this is what's incredible to me. We've been mates, like you said, since we were 13 years old and we used to sit around, Yeah, we would go to the cricket, like we would talk about cricket endlessly. We were obsessed by the game and all these people we were obsessed by, the people that, I mean, I remember you and I going to Melbourne to see Alan Border play his 100th test and then, of course, suddenly you're working with Alan Border. You know who Alan Border is. You know who Ian Botham is. You know who Brian Lara is. But Shane Warne, like what, just tell me a little bit about what it was like to get to know Warney and what your recollections are. Well, it, it's – you're spot on, mate. And, and the two cricketers of my generation, our generation, that I would down tools – would if Warney was bowling or Gilly was batting. So, to, to and Alan Border was, as you know, mate, you've seen my scrapbook. He was my sporting hero. So, to sit there with, you know, I, I've sat there before in commentary with Warney and Gilly and AB, and, and you're looking across thinking, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm going to get found out here. They, you know, if, if, if we could be transported back and there was posters of them on my wall, they'd realise I'm an imposter here. So, it, I, I still go to work every day thinking it's a massive privilege to – be involved with these people. Warney, I've still got – I was actually looking at it this morning, mate. He he pops up. I've got, I've got a picture above in my, where I do the podcast here of of me interviewing Warney and Kelly Slater together before I knew Shane. And I look at it. I, I was in the bathroom this morning and he, um, he gave us all uh, – two boxing days ago, he gave us all for Christmas uh, some of his um, – Aftershave, the SW23, the yeah. cologne. Oh. And I've got a few because i got Wazim Akram's 501 as well, which comes in a little ball wheel and there's a, a red ball for the men and a white ball for the women and you flip the top open, you give it two sprays and look out because it's a pungent aroma from Wazim. But but I haven't, I, I've never opened Warnies and, and it's still sitting in there. So there's reminders of him every day. Um, the best way to describe him when people ask you is he's – as polite a person as I've ever met, like you would get to the cricket and he would know the lady's name at the Adelaide Oval, Sue, that's been on the door there forever. And he would say hello and he would use her name and her face would light up. So the interactions he'd have when you would walk behind him into a cricket ground and he looked people in the eye, he shook their hand or he used their name, it was a massive glow behind him, mate, because you were walking a metre behind him and you saw the person's face light up when he used their name and you would see that. He was already on to the next person or the next selfie. So to see this just parade of joy that he used to leave behind him in a wake because he was kind and generous with people is the thing that really sticks with me. Um, at a test match, mate, if the first ball's at um, – 10 past 10 and the coverage on Fox is coming on at 10 past 9. They want you there at sort of 10 past 7. They want you two hours beforehand until Mark Waugh organised a uproar and said, I'm not coming in two hours earlier anymore. And it was an hour and a half. But so <laughs> Warney and I were – you don't want to expend all your energy before the day's coverage starts. So we would always want to get there a minute before the production meeting. So therefore, for probably the last three years, I'd always get a cab in with Shane and a cab back with Shane. Um and if I could give you a quarter of the stories that he rolled out in those periods, Will, she'd be the biggest rating podcast <laughs> any of us have ever been involved in. So I, I, I'm privileged to have got to know him a bit. And I think the biggest impact he had on me, mate, he, he was a great 
you know, in our country, we often, there's the tall poppy and we want to cut people down that are successful with our athletes, with our politicians, with our performers. We almost want people to fail before they succeed so we can see the redemption story. Warney was very much out of the American way that he wanted to see people succeed. And he never, he knew I'd never called test cricket and he didn't say anything for the first year. And the second year he pulled me aside and he said, mate, I think you need to approach test cricket like you do big bash. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, in the big bash, you walk into the commentary box and it looks and feels like you know exactly what you're doing and you're ready to take charge. He said, sometimes in the test cricket, you sound a bit reticent. And I said, well, mate, that's because I'm sitting next to you and and Alan Border and Mark War and these legends of the game that goes the full circle, mate, that we talked about that you grew up idolising. And he said, yeah, but mate, you're not here because you play cricket. You're here to broadcast the game and you've got to have confidence in yourself to do that. And he was a he was a big supporter in that he's just like just get out there and do it. Let yourself go. Take your handbrake off. Get out of first gear. Um, and that made a, a massive impact on me and certainly helped me. So whenever I go to the Test cricket now, I have that thought in my head that Warney would his expression was bring it, bring it, H, just bring it, bring it. So in those periods where you've stuffed something up or something is in the back of your mind, gee, I didn't very do a good job of that, I can just feel him saying, bring it, bring it. And that's sort of, I have that in the back of my mind. So it's a beautiful memory to have of a man that so many people miss. Um, and and I, like, I'm like i like you, Matt. I still can't believe that I can talk about him as someone I know because I was in the Lakes Entrance Caravan Park with Pete and Dave Shepherd, good friends of ours, when he took 7 for 52 against the West Indies. So to be able to relay some stories about him in a positive light, is it makes me feel good, mate. Uh, I love what you say about the effect that he had on other people. I literally was just happened to be talking to somebody yesterday for my philosophy podcast who has just made a TV show, a Netflix series with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And they were saying it's a very similar thing in that I think that Warney and Arnie from – apparently he's fine with people saying, you know, get him to the chopper and, <laughs> you know, like it's not a tumour and all those sort of things. And like when he goes to the toilet, he, he says, I'll be back. And <laughs> like he does the whole thing because he realised it's not really about him. Like I, I think this is the thing that sometimes people get confused with. Like every one of those people that Warney talked to or Arnie has that moment now has a story for the rest of their life. So for Warney or for Arnie or these sort of people, like you said, they've moved on to the next person. They're not there to see the smile on the face or the whatever. For them, it's just a little moment in their day and it happens over and over and over and over. But for the person at the other end of that story, that's that story they get to tell for the the rest of their life when, you know, they saw Arnold Schwarzenegger and they got to yell out, get him to the chopper and Arnie <laughs> was, you know, fine with it. So that's a good story to hear. I, I appreciate that. So look, as you said, uh, like this encouragement of you stepping in, I mean, I, I'm reminded of the fact that Warney famously had that uh, artwork with all those famous celebrities, yes. you know, uh, and, and also Shane. Around his pool. Them. Around uh, his pool. So that it was it, pictured around, it was based around a party at his place around his pool. And then he, he that seems similar to what you're doing, which is like you are the Shane Warne in that and then suddenly you're alongside all these celebrities, these icons of the game of cricket, but you're not there to be a fan of them. You're there to do a job that they're specifically hired you to in that situation. You've got to bring it. And you have – to the point where now this job is now taking you all over the world. So Australia is just about to play the World Test Championship. Now, for people who don't know, I think this is a reasonably new thing when it comes to World Test Cricket, and I, I'm not sure that it's something that everybody's going to be across. So yeah, this is the second one. Australia would have qualified for the last one, but we had a run rate issue, we I did. believe. Yeah, we did. Uh, and we lost did. the point because – it's a weird calculation. Do you have any idea how they actually like, – do, do you know how they come up with the two teams that play in the World Test Championship? Because it seems like an incredible formula, a secret Coca-Cola-style formula that gets passed out on a piece of paper that no one fully understands. Uh, to me, it's like the pressure rating in the <laughs> AFL. And I turn to David King beside mm. me and say, how do they come up with this? <laughs> He's like, it's complex. So if he doesn't understand it, my response to you with all that will is it's complex and I don't want to bore you with fine details sounding like I know the exact formula but having no idea. There is no real formula. It's it, They're trying to calculate who the two best teams of 
what is it? Two years, isn't it? Every two years, yeah, no, yeah or four years, yeah. It, it, well, I, yeah, it's running every couple of years, but but it, it, you know, you've got to take into how many tests you've played, how many tests you played away, how many tests you played at home. It's it's complex, but I think at the this particular time, if you look back over the last year, the qualification period, Australia and India have been the two best sides. England have come late. Um, but in a way, it's good that it's not England because we're about to be served up five Australia-England test matches in the Ashes. So it would have been a shame, mate, if it was Australia-England in the World Test and then five more. So I think this is a, a perfect result that we're seeing a different test. And I'm really excited about it, mate. I'm really – like you've got to, there's a serious commitment coming up over the next two months. You, you've got to put your family to the side. You've got to prepare. You've got to hydrate. You've got to get your meals ready because there's a lot of cricket coming your way, Will, and you don't want to be fading deep into the third session. I mean, what you've really got to do is commit yourself to a podcast for a couple of months so that you can justify the massive <laughs> periods in your diary that you've struck out to watch Test Match Cricket. But, but that will, Ideally, that's, it's quite good time. That, that, it starts at night. Yeah, it does. That, but that's my life, Will. Like, yeah. I, I've, I've come home from the IPL and me and my son are sitting up the other night watching the IPL final and my uh, beautiful Erica, who you know, is like, I, I think it's time. You, you've, you've been watching enough cricket and we just turn around and even my son says, it's research for dad. So it's the, yeah. it's the perfect answer. <laughs> well, I'm at work. I'm at work on the couch watching the cricket. You're actually at work. I had to invent a job, but I have done it and I am committed to it and this is it. We've started it. So this is good news. So you mentioned the IPL. So maybe let's start with the IPL, which is a good way to get us to India because obviously, as you said, Australia is, and I agree with you, Australia playing India off the back of us, Look, the first two tests in India obviously were an absolute disaster, but we we rallied and played better and when we got the team together and all those sort of things, it was really competitive against the Indians. So to then be able to play them in a test on neutral ground I think is absolutely fascinating. Like that's already really exciting to me. Like we get to see – how are we against India if you take Australian conditions or Indian conditions out of the picture? Are we good against this side? And then, as you said, the other side that probably could put their hand up, at least in the last you know, 12 months, and say we deserve to be there is England. And so we roll off to a five-match you know, test match series in England. So this is – it's brilliant to really genuinely see who the best teams in world cricket are at the moment and what styles are the best styles in world cricket. And and it's a bit like the AFL at the moment in that the dominant teams in the AFL are the ones playing the most exciting football. And I always think that that's, that's good for test cricket if the best teams in test cricket are the ones who are playing the most exciting test cricket as well. So give us an insight into you went to the IPL. Like tell us a little bit of that story. I mean, that's incredible. Mate, the IPL was, was all time. It's like – I won't I won't bore you with it, but it's like no sporting event I've ever seen. The first game I did was in Ahmedabad. Well, I mean, but paint the picture. So for people who don't understand the IPO, like how long does it go for? Like we hear about these huge auctions. Like that's I, I reckon for most Australians, they hear about the big money that people get in these auctions. They see some highlights. Because of the timing of it, they see some highlights on breakfast TV in the morning of people smashing sixes all over the place. But that's probably all they see about the IPL unless they're serious cricket fans. But this is like big in a way we can't imagine in Australia, right? So big, it, it has opened my mind for the first time to the whole discussion of franchise versus country, like we have with the Socceroos or are you committing to West Ham because that's who's paying your bills. I've never thought that would be part of cricket in my generation. Will, I've come home from the IPL, think it's inevitable that players, more and more players, and it's not, it, it is partly money oriented, but it's also the way these players are traded, like the, the way Cam Green is treated by the Mumbai Indians, and he, he's getting, you know, three and a half million dollars for eight weeks. Don't, don't get me wrong. But the way he is treated and loved and looked after and made to feel part of their organisation, it, it's a compelling argument for the young cricketers coming through. So, yeah, the IPL runs for 74 games across eight weeks. The stadiums and crowds are huge. The first game I did in Ahmedabad where there was a test, you would have watched it. It's a 132,000-seat stadium, so 30,000 more than the MCG. Mm. It was, I think they had 98,000 the, the night I turned up for. And uh. and in AFL or NRL parlance, it's like every game is a preliminary final atmosphere. The crowd are going 
off. I did a game in Kolkata, Will, where it rained for 45 minutes and the crowd was like it was the last two minutes of an AFL ground. They're going bananas just when the rain's <laughs> happening. So the passion, the size, the money involved, the money's only going to get bigger. Um, they're talking about it, the next super auction in two years' time. Wages could almost double. So, you know, Cam Green could be in a position where he's being offered – like seriously, will five or six million dollars for eight weeks work? And the 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 TV rights nine bill for six five years. The scale of the whole thing. But the players, look, I think there's a stat, mate, in in the AFL, or, or I think Australian cricketers get about thirty percent of total revenue. I think in the NBA it's above fifty. The EPL it's above sixty. In the IPL it's in the teens. So. They're only getting a small cut of the pie percentage-wise, but the numbers are still massive. And the the only other thing to tell you about it is the players are like nothing I've ever seen. I I imagine Virat Kohli in India is like Messi in Argentina, and I don't say that lightly. Like the, The cricketers can't leave the hotel. Like Glenn Maxwell cannot leave the hotel where he's playing, let alone Rohit Sharma, because the love and the want of the biggest populous nation in the world to get that photo or interaction is, mate, like nothing I have ever experienced before. The, 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 the crush of people at the door of these cricketers is next level, mate. Does that extend to like those around cricket? So, I mean, obviously you were there commentating for a couple of weeks, but like are people aware of who you are because you're associated with this thing that is such a huge, you know, event? It's a great question. I'll give you two examples. I was at an airport in, I think it was Jaipur, and I saw a bloke getting all these selfies before I got on the plane. I was like, who's that? I turned around, and he turned around. It's a gentleman by the name, Will, of Rod Tucker. Now, you have to be a Sheffield Shield Mm. aficionado to know that he played for Tasmania for a long period of time. Rod is now an IPL umpire. So your umpires Mm. are getting besieged by selfie hunters. Um, And, and mate, I found that bizarre to be – I had a – you know, you know, I'm not a man to stay in the hotel. I wanted to get out and explore. And when people come up to you on the streets in Mahali or in Kolkata or in Delhi and know your nickname and want to talk to you about cricket or Scott Boland and the statue, it's – for someone from country Victoria, it's mind-blowing to know that people know who you are because, not because you've done anything special, just because of their love and, and they've watched those last two India-Australia test series and seen their mission, man Rishabh Pant win the series. So, yeah, it's um when when they knock on your door in a hotel with something you did in order and you realise they're, they're there to politely <laughs> ask for a photo, it blows your mind and it's... it's um, <laughs> Like when the when the room service comes or the laundry comes, that's not yours, and that's like, can we have a selfie? It's it blows your mind, and you feel you feel wanted and loved, Will, which is not always the feeling as a commentator in Australia on various codes. To be fair, I mean, it is a very different situation, isn't it? I mean, there is. I mean, I, look, the appeal for young cricketers, like can't imagine what it's like because you could literally be the 20th best like test match cricketer in Australia and basically what that means is that you spend the majority of your life playing Sheffield Shield cricket in front of nobody like really like you know right whereas you can be the 20th best like you know 2020 player in Australia and be you know, all over the world like playing in these incredible tournaments having these amazing experiences earning Money like you would never imagine in your life. Yeah, I, I, there's various examples of that, mate. Like you look at Tim David, bloke was born in Singapore, played um, associate cricket for Singapore. Now he's in the Australian T20 side. Yeah, 20 years ago, Tim's probably not getting a game in Sheffield Shield cricket. So he, he's probably mm. one of those blokes you're playing grade cricket and just smashes the ball out of the park. It's like, <laughs> who's this bloke? Yeah. But now yeah. he, he is doing that for six teams around the world and earning <laughs> three million bucks a year. Um, and the associated pressure comes with that. I, I spoke to him at, at a, a cricket ground where Mumbai was playing. So his, his role, basically, Will, his role is to come in in the perfect game in the 17th over and face 10 balls and make 30. If that's what he does, then that's his million bucks a year. And he'd just come off doing that. He'd, he'd hit 
three sixes in the final over to win Mumbai a game. And the next morning, it was, you, you can't escape it. You're at the airport, you're in the gym, it's in the newspaper, it's on every television you see. And I said to him, wow, I, I, I've seen your three sixes 38,000 times in the last 24 hours. And he said, when it's like that, and it's fantastic, and you're in the gym yourself, and you're watching your highlights, he said, it's wonderful self-affirmation. But he said, when you've made a duck, and you're on the other side of the world, and everywhere you go, that duck is being replayed, and people are saying he's getting paid a million bucks a year for eight weeks. What's he doing? I think that's the when the mental pressure is just crushing on these guys, and that's Tim David, let alone Virat Kohli, who's the, the country stops, or MS Dhoni when they go out to bat, like the country stops. I'm, I'm interested in, like, so for people who don't know what the franchise like model is, basically the idea being that these big Indian teams in particular, uh, the one they then have their own teams, you know, in other competitions, 2020 co- competitions around the world. And so basically somebody like Tim David would just literally play for the same team in, like, you know, these different countries. And so you can understand how for a player like that where your job is – you know, like you said, you know, you some days it's going to work and some days it's not going to work. That security of saying, it's okay, we've got you all year round and, you know, the IPL didn't go that well this year, but you're off to Bangladesh and you're going to smash it over there and you'll get, you know, you'll be fine and then you'll be off to, you know, South Africa to play in South Africa as well. You can understand for those sort of players that sort of security of signing up to a franchise knowing you've got a year-long contract to play would be, would probably help with some of what you're saying. Or, and how do you turn it down, Will? How do you say no? Like, it's it, so in my situation, if I'm working for Fox and then you get an offer for five times as much by another network, which, if anyone's out there, um, I can give my management details over. That would be nice. But um, <laughs> no, I love Fox. They're the best place I've ever worked in all seriousness. But it, it's people say, oh, they're just doing it for the money. Well, that's okay. Because they've got a short period of time to make the money and good luck to them, mate. Good luck to these people because they're on the other side of the world. They have no support. Like Tim David can't come home and train in Australia with a state cricket club because he's got no association. Like, so these guys are, right. you, know, you know, like, <laughs> at, like, mate, there's no association. Like Aaron Finch yes. is about to go and play in America. There's a bloke where I live in Ocean Grove that's got an indoor net that – uh, teachers, kids, like Finchie will be down there facing by himself ball after ball in a machine. So it's a very different way of approaching cricket. But I think the, the standout thing for me is I, I don't know how the big name Indian players deal with the pressure. Mate. I stayed in a, in a hotel with Virat Kohli, uh, RCB, Maxi's team, Glenn Maxwell's team. And there was, you get out on your on your floor, there's a guy with a machine gun outside various rooms. He's not there for me, obviously. Like the security is next level. <laughs> um, he's surrounded at breakfast by an entourage. And then people just want to say, you know, we talked about Warney, uh, uh, the interaction. I met Shane Warney, he said this. With Virat, it's, I just want to see him play. There's a guy, there was guys, I did an RCB game, Royal Challenges, who he plays for. And there was, whether it's, you don't know, but two guys are holding up a sign saying, Virat, I sold my iMac to buy tickets to watch you bat. Now, if I'm walking out to bat and the whole country is <laughs> is watching and people are selling away their uh, items to watch you play, mate, the pressure, I, I can't conceive. You must just have to put yourself in a bubble to, to, to be able to, Keep that pressure away from your front door. It's next, and that's nothing to do with money. That's that's the size of a country who wants to see you succeed like no other. And if you don't succeed, they have a, they'll have a crack as well. They'll have, they have a serious crack. Okay, so there's another Indian cricketer I'm fascinated about while we're talking about the IPL, and that is a fellow by the name of MS Dhoni. So, what can you tell me about MS Dhoni? Well, I've, Mike Hussey um, is on the coaching staff at Chennai. He used to play for Chennai, so he used to play with Dhoni um, and now is on the coaching panel. They just won again. They, so they just won their fifth title. Um, he, he's running around, batting the last over because he's there as a keeper. And it, it's like I, I presume before going to India that Kohli was the most popular cricketer in India. MS Dhoni is the most popular cricketer in India. So he's grown up from a small 
regional area, a place called Ranchy. Um, country boy, not from a rich or well-looked-after background. So he's someone that India can identify with because they are him. They, are, they can see themselves in MS Dhoni. Local country boy made good, always carries himself beautifully away from the cricket ground. So, but, but talking to Huss, I said, what is it about him? And he said, mate, he is so calm. He just wants you to enjoy your cricket. He doesn't want stress. He doesn't want overexcitement in his team. He just wants a calm atmosphere where you are allowed to get on and do your job. And he, it, it obviously works beautifully for Chennai. But he, he just he was interviewed by the great Harsha Bogle at the end of the tournament. So if you're in Kolkata, the Knight Riders are the local team. Eden Gardens, 70,000 people seat stadium. It, it's besieged by purple flags. That's, that's Kolkata, the Knight Riders, their colour. When Chennai's in town, the entire stadium is decked out in yellow because everyone is there just to see MS. So the travelling fans, the local fans, they'll change allegiance just to watch him play. They, they didn't see him for a couple of years with COVID, so it was like this year was his swan song. But he announced at the end of the tournament the love that he had been shown by the Indian people had made an impression deep on him. As a result, even at his age, he said, listen, I, I need to start training in eight months for another IPL. If my body is good to go, I want to play again just to give back the love to the Indian people. So he is, mate, he's, he's, he is next level adored. I don't know how they live their life. I don't know, that they, you know, they can't go out for dinner or go for out to see their kids play sport, but he, he he's the number one, mate. He's a fascinating character. Well, I heard he's a bit of a mystery figure in that, like, when he's not playing, he does disappear. He's not very much seen in Indian life at all in between. He just comes back and and re-emerges to, to dominate and win this tournament that everybody wants to win constantly. But the, I heard that speech at the end of the game the other night, and it was like the rock at WrestleMania, yeah. like the way that he was controlling <laughs> yes. the crowd because yeah. it was all very much like, I guess this would be the best time for me to announce that I'm going to retire from the game. And like, you know, all these people are just like, oh, and he goes, <laughs> but, and they're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> it was like he was conducting the crowd, wasn't he? I think from I think from what I've been told in his small area of Ranchy where he lives, because he's grown up there, People aren't so, oh, my God, it's MS Dhoni. So he's allowed to come out of his compound occasionally and live a more normal life. Although, I, you know, I asked questions everywhere I went. And I was like, so can Dhoni go out to a restaurant? They said, well, he owns a restaurant chain. So he can go to his restaurant and they shut it down. But, he, <laughs> but he's not going to La Paqueta's on the corner, Will, by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and, uh, look, I... I well, obviously, I want to talk to, about cricket with you, but I want to just quickly before we get on to uh, that, I just really want to like talk about the wh- what your experience of India was because you say, as I know about you, you're not a person who's going to stay like in an you know an expensive Western style hotel for your experience of being in India. You're the sort of person who wants to get out there and see you know, what Indian life is actually like on the streets. So did you get an opportunity to do that? And is there any particular moment of that that you can share with us? Yeah, the, uh, my favourite moment of the whole trip I'll, I'll tell you about, um, and you'll appreciate it because of the way we grew up. But I think it is – so you do a game of a night, an IPL game, you know, T20 cricket's meant to run three hours. The IPL game might go for five hours. Um, so you get home to your hotel at 1 o'clock in the morning – Generally, you get on a flight at 9 a.m. the next morning and go to the next city, and then you have that afternoon and night off, and you do a game the next night. So you do a game every two nights. So I would generally get to a new city, Ahmedabad, Jaipur, Kolkata, Delhi, Mahali, names that meant nothing to me a month ago, um, and I would have the afternoon to do what I wanted. I'd do my prep the next day, so I would just walk. Like I walked and walked and walked, and... I was in Delhi for the Commonwealth Games in 2010, and the hotel was amazing. Everything else was chaotic, but will I did this is this is the modern India. So you have these preconceived ideas in your mind. I think I did 16 flights in the period I was there. Um, so I think I went to eight different airports. Every airport had been rebuilt or was brand new in the last three years. Like airports. Unbelievable. I always look at customs and security with travel, reflect the country. Customs took two minutes to get through. Security was three minutes to get through. 16 flights, not one delay. In fact, some flights arrived early. So 
Very different to my experience in Australia in the last couple of years and your experience. So that, that's a sort of snapshot of where India's at. Um, it's a massively um, – the, the middle class is booming. Um, it's just become the most populous nation in the world. There is – you can walk out your hotel door in Kolkata and be confronted by poverty, the, like poverty that we're not accustomed to. But you can also walk out your front door instead of turning left, turn right – and there is a massive building full of executives in tech, in IT, in supercomputers. But my favourite experience, mate, I played a lot of – like there's, there's cricket everywhere. So for blokes like you and me, it's the cliche, but every laneway, every alley, someone's playing cricket. So I, I, um, I played a lot of cricket with a lot of different kids and blokes. I played a game of cricket with – outside my hotel in Ahmedabad, beautiful hotel – I was coming back for a walk, exactly what we're talking about, six o'clock at night, the sun's going down and these guys are playing cricket and they call me over and say, do you want to play? So it's the it's the guys from the hotel that I'm working in. Their shift finishes at six o'clock and unfortunately for them, they say, oh, we don't play as much cricket as we want because we've got commitment. So how often are you playing, boys? Well, we only get to do this six nights a week. So on the seventh night, we've got family <laughs> So I'm like, right, are you going okay? So they're playing in a, in a cow paddock and I'm bowling to the head chef. I, I'm facing batting the chief financial officer. So these, these are men with commitments and their obsession for the game. But I, I had a hit in, in Kolkata, mate. So a, a proper cricket club had just finished their training and I was wandering by and they were asking me about the IPL and commentary and they said, did you want to have a bat? And I was like, yeah, I, I would like to have a bat. So they lent me pads, gloves. Thigh pad, um, and it's the it's the theory, mate, that Aussies struggle against the spin in India, and like they had four spinners. Like they, their opening bowler was a quick. They told me he gets two overs in the eighty overs they play, yeah. and then the spinners come on. So you, you walk, you mark, and it's like this. This, there's no grass anywhere. It's just sort of this roll mud and you think, I wonder if it's true about how far the ball spins. And this leggy just sort of wanders in and it's like I'm facing Warney and they've got Rongans, Toppies, Flippers. They absolutely destroy me, Will. And and they celebrated every wicket, every time they got me out. That that was my moment in India where I was like, wow, I'm a, I'm a kid like you that grew up obsessed with cricket. You, we used to play in your homemade cricket net and now I'm facing spinners in India and getting destroyed. Like I feel like a real Australian test cricketer now. That's how I felt because I was getting knocked over left, right and centre by the Indian spinners. I was going to say, I think Graham's still got that uh, concrete <laughs> cricket net out the back of the house. So if, if Finchie needs to go down to East Gippsland. <laughs> if he needs to prepare on Mill Felt to head to the USA, then, then he'll be right to go. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's talk about this World Test Championship. Australia um, playing against India before we get into the Ashes. And so... We like what's your like? I mean, again, obviously, we hear a lot of the Australian news with the Australian team. The big points of interest seem to be around firstly, it looks like David Warner is going to get to open the batting, like they get because he's been part of this team very much, at least for the World Test Championship. It seems that Warner is going to get the opportunity. He's been playing with the team that made it to the final, he's going to get the opportunity to open the batting. Um, there's a bit of an injury cloud over Hazelwood at the moment, maybe he might not be right to play. Um, but what are you like? What are you looking forward to? Like, what are you interested in about the World Test Championship? And give us like some Indian perspective as well. Well, firstly, from the, I, I'm looking forward, as I said, to see what type of deck it is. I, I saw Josh play his first comeback game. I can't even remember what city it was. Um, and before we go into any of this, there's a discussion about how much does T20 cricket relate to Test cricket. Uh, I'm not the expert, but mate, good form is good form for me. So if you're batting beautifully, it's going to help. If you're bowling well, it's going to help. So Hazelwood was straight on a line in length. I, 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 don't, I think there's only one decision for the Aussies to make, and that's Boland or Hazelwood. Um, obviously, Michael Ness has been getting wickets for fun in county cricket and making hundreds, but they haven't added him to the squad. So I think it's Boland or Hazelwood. I wouldn't be surprised if they think we just want to give Hazelwood another test match to to get 100% over his Achilles and his side. So maybe they go for Boland. The the guy that I'm, from an Australian perspective, mate, we'll talk about India, but the guy that I can't wait to see is Cam Green. I, I don't want to say Steve Waugh, 989 Ashes, but I think there's I think there's something special coming. Like he's 
around the last couple of years when you're out in the ground beforehand, he's a really quiet bloke. He doesn't really, he almost he doesn't, he doesn't look you in the eye. You can see from the outside, he looks like a bloke still finding his way and not completely comfortable with the setup. I saw him in India halfway through and I went up and had a chat with him. So he, he's playing for Mumbai. The, probably the, the the fanciest franchise there is, Tendulkar's ex-franchise. Sachin Tendulkar's sitting on the bench giving him advice. Like it's, And he's he's batting anywhere, one, two, three or four. He's opening the bowling at times. He's getting paid $3.5 million and he was worth the money, Will. It wasn't, oh, my God, they've overpaid him. This is a 20-year-old kid, 22-year-old kid from Perth who Mumbai have looked at and thought we've spent three and a half. You know what? He was worth it. He was box office. And just talking to him... He just had a presence to him that it was like, oh, I'm fitting in here. I'm playing with Rohit Sharma. I'm playing with these guys, but you know what? I'm at this level, so I can't wait to see him, mate, because I think across the WTC and the Ashes, I think we've seen an amazing start to his career, but we might really see him blossom with bad and ball. He's such a talent, Will. Like You've seen this bloke play such a talent. It was. It's one of those things where a couple of years ago, like his bowling started to come good, and then he had a couple of injuries there. But his batting started to really step up. Obviously, it wasn't a coincidence that Australia did better in the tests in India as soon as he came into the team. Like the team is always much be- better balanced with him in it. But also, he was a great batsman in the test version of the game. Like he, he can make, you know, 12, 12 off 100 balls if you need to do that as well as making 100 off 12 balls, you know, which is incredible. He, the thing that, I mean, I think he's he's one of those people that you can just see why they've invested so much time and so much patience in him because the reward of it, when it all clicks at the same time, he's just going to be unstoppable. And it does feel like he's getting towards that. And I would love nothing more than this to be, like, it does feel like this could be it, right? Like this could be, it, ordinarily with the Ashes, there is, if the Australia is to do well, there's going to be one player, whether it be a Steve Smith or wherever it be a Steve War or whoever it might be, but somebody has like an incredible series where they just cannot be stopped. And it would be amazing if it was him because I think he's worked hard to deserve it. I think he's ready. But also it would be amazing because Kane Corns spent a lot of time earlier this year really talking about how he shouldn't be in the team and he did not understand what the Australians saw in him. And that would it would just give me that extra pleasure. Of... <laughs> I wasn't aware of the Corns' comments, but uh, that doesn't surprise me. Um, no, nah, he's box office, mate. He, he's box office. He's the future of Australian cricket. Um, so that, that's the Aussies. The Indians, I'd normally be a bit, what do you think of the opener? Oh, no. So let's just talk the, before we get to the Indians. Let's say, uh, let's you know this test, and then looking forward, do you think do do you think Dave Warner will be the opener for Australia in the fifth Ashes Test? Gee, that's a good question, Will. Um, I think he will. I think, I think he. A skill comes into it. Obviously, he's going to have to face Stuart Broad. He will have been thinking, planning, preparing. I think certainly in the WTC, he deserves his spot 100% because this is a rewarding a team that's been the best performed two teams of the year, and he's been part of that team. So, but yeah, I think he will. Um, it's. I, I talk to Mark War selection a lot because he was a selector. Um, we used to tease him when blokes had come in and out. He, he was heavily involved in getting Tim Payne into the test team, which was um, a, a, a from the clouds call. So when they get it right, um, as Junior would always say, well, if someone should be coming in, who are they going to drop? Or if you're going to drop him, who's coming in? So my answer is yes, Warner, because I think he will succeed. But it, there's no... Jamie Siddons or Darren Lehman or these guys, Brad Hodge making thousands of runs in shield cricket because cricket doesn't work like that anymore. So if you're not picking Warner, are you really confident that Harris and Renshaw can come and dominate an Ashes? That, that's the question you've got to ask yourself if you're getting rid of David Warner. What do you think? Oh, well, that is the problem, right, isn't it? Like it is one of those things where you just keep thinking – of like, yeah, you because know, obviously you could see a version in Australia of like what Travis Head did in India. 
Like you could see the idea that maybe Head could be like a really effective opener in Australia and places like that. And he proved that he could do it in India. But it doesn't feel like this is the time to be like going with that experiment. Like it feels like we needed an opener and Head to bat in the middle of the order for like this series. So um, it is. It's hard to like because if Renshaw had gone to India and played really well and Harris has been going fine in English conditions like playing over there, like he's doing everything he could do but – you you always feel like even him at his best, he's probably only ever going to be like an averages thirty five, averages forty, you know, cricketer at, at, at that highest level if he could possibly do it. So yeah, I agree with you. It's like it's like who do you replace him with? That's the problem. Like you want him to do well because you otherwise you're like who do we replace him? Yeah, with? and I'm sure if um, if Harry or or Matt Renshaw gets their opportunity, they'll make a fist of it. And then you know they're vastly experienced cricketers and they've got a lot of experience in England. But I just think there's something about David Warner that just he is he is like every cliche that 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 uh, that Robert Craddock would put in there about a street fighter or tough as nails. <laughs> like that that's that's what he is. You know what I mean? Mm. That's he is your he is your Gideon Hay street brawler. That that's that's what he is. And I, I hope he succeeds because. Um, like in the AFL just recently, for those that follow footy and your, your footy podcast, Damien Hardwick has gone out of his own accord and stepped away. And I think it's great when champions of any sport get that opportunity. And I hope that is what's afforded to Dave because we talked about Warney and Gilly. You know, when Warner came out to bat in his pomp wheel, you, weren't, you were not turning the telly off because it was Dave Warner and all of a sudden he could be 100 off 70 balls in a test match in, in a time when that, that wasn't happening. Well, he was he was basically the guy who uh, the first one we knew, at least from the Australian point of view, of this new model of what cricket is. Like, you know, he was the guy who got picked in the twenty twenty, the one day teams first, and became a Test cricketer. Yeah. Yeah, everyone was always like, "Oh, Warner won't be able to play Test cricket," but they didn't realise that Test cricket needed to go in the direction that David Warner was going to be one of the people who helped take it there. And obviously, when we look at England now with baseball and the way they play cricket, they all play like Dave Warner. You know, that's that's part of the point is they've got a team of people who played like Dave Warner used to play because that's the way that cricket has gone. So, I mean, I think at his best we need him. He just has rarely been at his best over there. I hope this is it. I hope that the MCG 200 wasn't what you were talking about, which was that perfect time to stop. Like, you know, that time to go, I've gone out at my peak and just say, thank you very much. This has been great. That's all the runs I have left. Thank you very much. I'm done. Because that could have been it. Yeah, there's a part of me that when he could not walk off, you know, like this is maybe this is it. Maybe just carry him off, say goodbye. Thank you very much, Dave Warner. But he's hung on now and I don't want it to be, yeah, you don't want it to end badly. You'd love him to be able to like do well enough that he can leave of his own accord. But but that shows you further, like we often, we, we write, talk about these people, but sometimes do we really think about the courage that Dave's displaying to go on? Because he could have walked away there and, and straight yeah. into commentary and, you know, he's prepared mm. to go and take on Stuart Broad, who he knows has yeah. destroyed him. But that's that's why these people are elite because they back themselves. Another reason I really hope Dave succeeds. We talked about Mark War and and the understanding of commentary and getting paid per Test match or per innings. Um, Dave was announced last summer that he would be joining Fox Cricket, which is fantastic. However, will oh, I can't wait to have the opportunity to hopefully work with him. But the sooner he comes to not be playing Test cricket. The sooner he's in the commentary box and the sooner he's taking a massive chunk out of the salary cap of Fox Cricket. So <laughs> I, I'm starting to think if he plays for another three years and I can just squeeze out another contract negotiation before Dave comes in and just gobbles it up, um, everyone's a winner, Will. Everyone's a winner. A bit of self-interest. Nah, mate. You, you, you're fine in this regard. Like Dave Warner's not coming in to replace you. This is not a like for like. Like I'd be worried if I was one of the, you know, the like, you know, I don't know, Brendan Julian or someone oh, might have to worry about what's right. going on. <laughs> right. Hello to BJ because I know he loves listening to all your shows. <laughs> So okay, well let's talk. I mean, with Ashes is exciting, and like, but we're getting ahead of the the first game that we have to concentrate on, which is India. So, how big? Like, I mean, obviously we've just had the IPL. How big will this WTC match be for India? Will they be all in? Will the country be invested in their Test team winning this and you know, kind of being rightly crowned the number one Test team in the world? Well, that that's that's the great worry, isn't it? Because if India was to lose interest in Test cricket. 
that's the mm. end of Test cricket. Yeah. Australia can play England in the mm-hmm. Ashes, but if India were to lose interest, um, and you saw the you saw the crowds at the Test matches, they were good, but they weren't IPL crowds. They they were nowhere near. You know, in Kolkata, they got seven home games, sixty five thousand seat stadium, every game sold out. Um, so, so that's the level it's at. But I think great credit must go to the former captain, Virat Kohli, who's been massively invested in Test cricket. And he's he loves the game. So he's brought the country with him to continue that love of Test cricket. So, yeah, India, I, I think they're all in. Um, they've beaten Australia, last two series in Australia, which has been incredible. Um, but I've seen, I've seen the future of Indian cricket, I reckon, Will. And there's a guy, we'll talk about who they will play. Here's, for those that don't follow the IPL and just have a passing interest, interest, and just to heap pressure on him, there's a kid in India that plays for Rajasthan. Um, who his name is uh, Yashaswai Jaiswal. So he opened the batting for the Royals, yeah, the pink team, um, Warney's old team. So, and this is the thing you love about Indian cricket. This this bloke's like nothing I've ever seen. Like, I, I, you know. You, you know, I've got an 11-year-old son. We go to the nets. It's like, mate, have a look early. Let the first couple go when he's batting out in the middle and I'm square leg. Mate, rotate the strike. Just have a look. Build for the first three or four overs. These Indian <laughs> kids come out from first ball and launch it over mid-wicket for six. And, you, and you're looking at your notes you're like, who's this bloke again? Um, so he's in the squad. They won't play him, but this is what I love about subcontinental cricket. He's a kid that grew up in the country, Will. Jai Swale, his name is, his surname. He had a dream to play cricket. I think it was Mumbai. He moved to Mumbai um, without his family, with no support as a kid, as a as a teenager. Um, had a job in a local dairy from the way Harsha explained it to me, but cricket commitments got in the way, so he lost his job. He spent three years at the cricket ground, the, the story goes, living in a tent with the groundsman. So he's living in a tent. At, in his teenage years, at 14, 15, 16, he's selling street food. He's a million miles away from playing cricket. He's going well, but they don't have the pathways that we have here where he's playing for the under-14 team and the under-16 team. It's like when Imran or Wazim would see a bloke in the nets at training and two tests later he'd be playing for Pakistan. Like, it's a different pathway. It's a beautiful, romantic pathway. This guy got spotted by someone. He is like no batsman of his age I have ever seen. He is box office, hasn't played a test match. Whether it translates, you look at him and you think it will. Um, a, a senior cricket person told me, I won't name them, but a senior cricketer, international cricketer told me that they hope he's given time to develop before he's thrown in. But when you've got a country of one point whatever billion cheering you on, you don't generally get time to be just <laughs> eased into the team. So... He's in the squad. I don't think he'll play, Will, but this I'm giving you a, a, an exclusive for non-Master Cricket fans. This kid is the next Virat Kohli, the next Rohit Sharma. You can't say Tendulkar because you get in trouble, but he is the next big thing in Indian cricket. It is good for cricket when Indian cricket is strong, clearly, but um, but we still want to beat them. So yeah. how do we do that? What are we doing? <laughs> what, are, what are we what are we trying to do well, here? Well, their their team they, they would have had Rohit Sharma, their captain, and probably Kale Rahul open the batting. Uh, I was at a, the ground when Kale did his hammy, so he did it badly, so missed the IPL, um, and and he's going to miss the WTC. So there, there was a guy. I saw him make 96 and interviewed him after the game by the name of Shubman Gill. And within two games, I was calling him the stylish mm-hmm. one because he, he reminds yeah. me of Mark Waugh, mate. He, you know that Steve Waugh 989 back foot sort of square cover drive? This guy's got a sort of straightish cover drive. This is real cricket porn talk now, but to the rising ball that he just flows through and you see him and you're just like, wow, this – so he was 96 not out, and he said, oh, yeah, I would have liked to get the 100 when I, when I had a chance to speak to him, but hopefully I get one soon. Well, he, he scored three in the next five games. Um, yeah. He is 
Like you've seen this guy, Will. He, Shubman Gill, yeah. he, he's worth the price of admission to watch this bloke bat. And whether it translates from a, a flat IPL T20 deck to a potentially early seeming ball against Cummins, Bowl and Stark, that's yet to be known. But if this bloke makes 50, it'll be a beautiful 50 that you want to watch. So I can't wait to see. I hope he makes big runs. I hope. You know, it's a great test match, and obviously um, I'd like the Aussies to win, but I hope to see Shubman Gill make runs. Okay, so tell us about Rowett as well. So, I mean, a legendary Indian cricket figure in his own right and, like, seems to have a bit of a different personality to perhaps, you know, some of the people that we've seen in those Indian leadership positions. So what, what's he like? He's he's like – um, well, he looks like a – a big cuddly teddy bear, you know what I mean? He's that, yeah. that's the that's the that's the shape of the dude. Like he he's made mm-hmm. white ball two hundreds that that you can't even comprehend. He had a really quiet, by his terms, captain of Mumbai had a really quiet IPL. Um, but he's he's like Warner or Saywag. If he bats for an hour and a half at the start of the test match, that could be the end of the test match because he might be on ninety yeah. off <laughs> seventy, and it's like holy moly. Then old Shubman and. You know, Pajara's still to come and then Virat wanders out. So he's probably their he's probably their key bat because he's like Warner. If he fires at the top of the order, he's pretty he's a pretty quiet guy. It's funny when you when you when you've got a night off the IPL and you find yourself in the hotel eating more naan bread, which I ate a lot of, um, watching the IPL. <laughs> Um, every ad features an Indian cricketer, and it seems to feature Rohit Sharma. So whoever his agent is. <laughs> Congratulations, because he must be making serious coin. Um, so, you know, Rowett and, and Shubman at the top of the order. Um, Pajara, as we know, um, you know, he's called the wall, just gets it done. He's been playing counter cricket with Steve Smith. Then they've got um, Coley, probably bah- Rahani. And then one of So let's talk about Virat yep. just for a second. So where's his test career at? Like, is there still... I mean, he didn't bat that badly when we played them in India. Like there was a couple of moments where he looked like he was about to really take us to town and luckily he really didn't. But like is there still years – is this like – are we saying goodbye to Virat at the moment? Is this like, you know, our sort of we all get to, you know, see him bat one more time or do you feel like there's still another Virat Kohli style, you know, series and act left in him? Yeah, that's a great question. I think he's – Remember when Tendulkar came out to Australia and he couldn't buy a run and then he kept getting out, edging behind and to the keeper and he came out and said in the press, I'm just going to put my cover drive away and he didn't play a cover drive and made 200. (laughs) And I was like, okay, well, that's how good he is. I think, you know, you can't compare Kohli to Tendulkar, but he he finished up the World uh, T20. um, He finished up the IPL with 200s. I think there's... Many more acts in Virat Kohli. I think, as I said, I don't, I don't understand the pressure he goes through, but he's such a – he's great to commentate. Like one night he, he had a blue after the game with one of his mm. former teammates, Gautam Gambier, and <laughs> like he, it's blown up and there's verbal and he just plays with passion, you know. When his bowling gets wickets, he's, you know, he's, he's got that full Teddy Witten stick it up him, which I love about him. Mm. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's plenty more runs. There's plenty more runs in Virat Kohli. Um, he, you know, he's he's made runs in England. He's had his failures in England as well. Um, he's probably still the talismanic wicket, isn't he? I think. Like if you and I are watching it and they knock over Virat cheaply, you're starting to think Australia's in here. If they, they get Gill or they get Road or they get Pajari, you're like, well, if they get Pajari, you know, that's going to be a shorter test because he can bat and bat. But if you get Coley, I think he's still he's still the wicket, isn't he? And Nathan Lyon has got a great record against him. He's got him out a lot of times in Test cricket. Okay, so uh, do you think the Australians just play one spinner, by the way? We didn't really talk about that. They just play one. They just play Lion, right? Well, uh, you know, it's – I don't know. People will pick me up, but apart from being in – like, can you recall a test Australia's played in England where they played two spinners? I I, I, I can't even recall the McGu- uh, Warren McGrath. So Todd Murphy probably doesn't play. So, yeah, I, I think we only play one spinner, surely, don't we? I mean – Unless, of course, and only I can say this, the BCCI <laughs> get the pitch together before the game, and it's a raging turner, and we need to we need to play three spinners again. That might be. Well, you the reckon they get their phone call to Ashton yeah, Agar okay. going through? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I think we only play. I think we only. I think we only play one spinner, don't we? 
I think we only play once. You know, be I, tough I, if we if we tough if we called Ashton back for another. <laughs> Just say, mate. Look, I know I didn't work out in India, but like, if you want to get over here, we might give you a crack. Mate, he made ninety nine over there, and he, in his Ashes uh, debut, he, he's a star. Now, I think we, um, I think he'll be back to Ashton Ago. I think we only play one spinner. Um, yeah, but I think Lyon v Coley is. Um, I talked about watching. Um, Shubman Gill, I think Lyon versus Coley is because he's so understated, Nathan. But he's got a lot more. Yeah, you know, he's coming up to playing his hundredth straight Test match. He's got a lot more internal drive than people might outwardly perceive of Nathan. Uh, I, I the the Nathan Lyon story to me is incredible because the idea that if we went through a period of time where the idea that a finger spinner would play more than the Sydney Test match for Australia or subcontinental tours. So it would always be like you might play one test in Australia if they played an extra spinner and you'd like you know, get called up for a subcontinental tour where you'd like you know, bowl 90 overs and get three wickets. Like that would be basically the story of like what would – for him to be our key spinner for that period of time, to play that many tests in a row, particularly when – like there was a period of time where the the broader public were not convinced. You know, it was always felt like, you know, Lion's going to go, we're going to find someone better. For him to have become one of the most successful bowlers in the history of Australian cricket. And I think he's going to be, I mean, I really think he, he's one of those people that makes a big difference in the Ashes, not just in this test, but whether we win the Ashes or not. Like I think it's going to be Basball versus Gazball, if you will, because I do think that Lyon's going to be such a significant player in that series. Yeah, well, it's I like the uh, Basball versus Gazball. Have you thought about that one or is that one just came to you? That's good. Just did just come to right. me. I've got to be honest with you, but oh, that's like, a headline. That'll get a headline. The, the first first time I said it, but it won't be the last. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it's like. <laughs> oh, I can see it in the Herald Sun. Gasball defeats Basball. Well, if you look at if you look at England, like automatically, there's no one popping into my head thinking, "Oh, we've got to worry about Graham Swan bowling spin." So that that's a point of advantage for Australia. He's um he's a remark. Like he's so low key, and when you um I, I get on with him as well as any Australian cricketer. And he, he's, he's always up for a chat out in the middle before a test match. And he'll say things to you like, you know, how's this pitch going to play? I don't know. I just, just got to, you know, I just hope I bowl well early and an early wicket would be good. And like he says things and you think, mate, you've, You've got like 500 test wickets. You, you, you played yeah. 100. T- like you're the man. I, he, I think his level of performance over such a long period of time stems from the fact that in his mind he still doesn't think he's the man. So he is still having to prove himself only in his mind now, not to anyone else's mind, but he's got that real – it's not a lack of confidence, but he's got that, well, I don't know how I'm going to go today feel, and it's like – Look at the numbers, Nath. You're going to go well today because you always do. So he's a fascinating – he's not the blustery bull at the gate, I'm going to dominate this test match character at all. He's the opposite of that, but he often does dominate the test match. It's one of the things I loved about seeing Australia play the three spinners in India was watching the young spinners look at him. Yeah. Like it was <laughs> like you were just like they they to to them he is a superstar because they're people who are literally trying to do the exact same thing as he did finger spin, right? And to play at the highest level and like I mean to see it, to be it, right? Like we thought after Warney there was going to be this gener- – and like Warney and McGill, we thought there'd be this generation of leg spinners. But leg spin is so difficult to master. Like that's – that it didn't. It just didn't lead to this next generation of everybody being an amazing leg spinner. Whereas like Nathan Lyon has opened the path for those young spinners and to know that they can have this – career in front of them at the test level playing for Australia. But to see them look at him, it was amazing. You just see them like follow him around like little puppies and stuff go, what can we learn? It was it was very cute. I loved it. And he he like um knowing Nathan's persona a little, he will be acutely aware of the rise of Todd Murphy and what that can potentially do to his test career. Um and and I noticed Todd quoted in the paper last week saying, you know, I love Nathan. He's a star. Like like you said, he, he's the man for me. 
but at the end of the day, I, I still want to perform well enough that I can be playing in the test side. So in, in typical test matches, not in the subcontinent, for him to be playing in the test side, Nathan Lyon's not in the test side. So, you know, Nathan will be acutely aware of that. I, I don't think it's anywhere near happening at the moment because he's a star. So you have the spinners. The spinners are a difference. The, the, the pace attack, um, the other guy that really stood out to me in the IPL was um, Mohamed Shami. So, you you know, you just think of him as, a, as an, another decent Indian fast bowler. He... Like when you talk to the other fast bowlers, they back to cricket porn again. They're like, "Oh, Shammy, what about the seam?" Like they talk about the seam and how <laughs> how upright the seam is the whole way down the wicket. And they all, even the Aussie boys, are like, "Oh, what about the seam on Shammy?" Like he oh. he. Uh, <laughs> As Kerry once famously said about Shammy, he's good in the dry and he's good in the wet, but that's a, that's a Kerry line. Um, he, he, he's the one that was swinging the ball early in the IPL and getting wickets. He's going to be the concern for Kawaja and um, yeah. and Dave Warner. Like um, Siraj and Yadav, like they're, they're elite test cricket bowlers, but they're not Shammy, who's got an incredible – if you dive into his numbers in the last – Five years compared to the first five years of his test career, he, he is like top three, top four in test cricket. So we often don't think of the Indians as a pace attack, but they've proven in Australia the last two series, one with Boomer and one without. But he's the other one alongside Shubman Gill that really caught my eye in the IBL that thought he could have three for five off six overs at the start of a test match and then, then, we're, in, then we're in trouble. How many spinners do you think India play in this test? It's a great question. Um and I've thought about this, Will, because I knew we were going to have a chat. I, ra, 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 <laughs> I'm, I appreciate yeah, this. Well, this is this is the <laughs> best level of cricket actual knowledge that this entire – Don't I would just like for people who've listened this far, don't expect that it will be, you know, this in-depth and we'll have actual, you know, perspective on these things. It will mostly be wild speculation from here on. Well, I can throw wild speculation as well. But I've I, like Ravi Ashwin um, – I don't know how many test wickets he's taken. He's next level. And also, I always come back to what these guys are to deal with. Of all the Indian cricketers I've dealt with, he is a gentleman. He looks you in the eye. He uses your name. Um, he's a respectful, feisty character out on the field. Though I'm a massive fan of Ashwin. So I think Ashwin plays. And this is the strength and the potential weakness of India. So did you see any of the IPL final? Yeah, I saw the I, I saw the the greatest thing in the world. By the way, not sponsored by this, Ko Minis. I've watched a lot of the IPL, but yes. I just watched it all the Ko Minis, yeah. which is a great. To be honest, is a great way to watch IPL because I mean, you know, yeah, the IPL is twenty twenty cricket is made up of highlights anyway. So when you cut it down to sometimes, if I watch an AFL game on on Ko Minis, you're like. I don't really actually know how this game went. I just know who kicked the goals and, you know, who took a spectacular mark. But I have no real sense of the game, whereas the IPL is actually made for minis. Like, if I could give, you know, I'm not an employee of the of Fox, but you are, so I've, here's the plug. Mm. KO minis, highly recommend them. Get on board. Oh, they're out, so you, but, yeah, they are. They're outstanding. You bought, <laughs> I find with the F1 I can get a bit lost, but I'm, I'm with you yeah. on cricket, the the, uh, the minis. So basically, to cut a long story short, the IPL final uh, looked like – like uh, Gujarat were going to win it, and then Chennai needed, I think it was, I don't know, was it 12 13 off the last over? Um, uh, bowled really well, bowled a few Yorkers, 10 to win off to a guy on strike called Ravindra Jadeja. Now, Warney always used to, and had a great relationship, played early days cricket with him in the IPL and called him the rock star. He said, the first time I met him, he wandered in and he just had a different level of confidence than all the rest of the Indian cricketers I'd met. Um, called him Ravi the rock star. When he scores a 50, he does the sword, which I love. Um, he's got the best bowling average statistically for those that have taken wickets against Australia since 1900. Like he destroys us with the ball and he's a gun fielder. So IPL final, they need 10 off two. Jadeja on strike, hits the second last ball for six. Oh, hang on, hang on. And then next ball's on leg stump, goes for four. He wins the IPL title for them. He is, he is their... Alongside Coley, he's their talisman. He's the guy that can do anything. So he bats six probably, I reckon, maybe. So if he bats six and he could well bowls out on his own. So therefore, the answer to your question, the long answer, I think they picked two spinners, um, Jadeja and, um, and Ravi Ashwin. But 
Jadeja probably bats at six ahead of the wiki. So we've got Cam Green at six. They've got Jadeja at six. Now, Jadeja's a gun, but if the quicks can get early wickets and all of a sudden they're 350 and Jadeja comes in at six, is there an opportunity at that point to to pile through India? He'd probably come out and make 110 off 48 and we'll go, bloody hell, Jadeja, he's done us with the bat as well as the ball. But that that's the... It, to get the second spinner in, they need to do something which will have a effect, a counterintuitive effect on another part of their team. And by him playing, he's probably batting six. So they're not playing the extra batsmen. So it, it, it's a strength of theirs and a potential weakness of theirs, depending on how he performs. Now, I, I look, you're a professional cricket commentator so like you know normally I'm just going to be bullying amateur comedians well professional comedians amateur cricket commentators into making bold predictions but who do you think wins is, is Australia good enough to beat India in, in in England we haven't beaten them anywhere else recently so England's our best chance uh do we have yeah can we do it before I answer that question I have one question for you how many people will listen to this podcast in India? <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm – yeah, you know what? Like I've seen – you've been over to India. Yeah. Your eyes have been open to the fact that people are pretty nice here. They're giving you selfies. Yeah. You're getting to play cricket with everybody over the yeah. time. Yeah. And suddenly you're like <laughs> – I remember when Brett Lee had a Bollywood career over <laughs> here right. and seemed like a really good decision. Yes. And young Mark Howard, <laughs> he likes to explore the world and he could really, like a small percentage of a billion fans, <laughs> like, you know, if the Howie games could expand to the Indian market and really capture that as yes. well. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. So you, you I'm were, fine you, with that. Let's, you, yeah. were, you were in year eight Japanese, you would not be what I call a clever man, but in understanding the complexity of this situation I've just delivered to you, you have picked up on it very well. You're a clever man. So, but um, Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, yeah, like without – so, I mean, look, we've spoken a lot about how great India is and how great Indian cricket is. Let's assume that – like, let's start with this premise. Australia didn't beat India in India and Australia didn't beat um, India in Australia in the last series we've played. So – Starting with that, the real big question is, can Australia beat India here? And if they were going to beat India, how do we beat India? I'll just throw one more thing into the mix and ask you a question, then I'll answer it for you. So we talk right at the start, we, you know, we're talking like cricket analysis now, which again is not normally something I do. I normally ask them the questions. But so of the Indian squad of 15, 14 of them were involved in the IPL. Of the Australian squad of 15, three of them were involved in the IPL. Smith mm. and Marnus have been playing cricket um, in England, um, so make that five. Boland, Lyon, Stark, Cummins, Carey, Head, haven't played a lot of cricket lately, have not played a lot of cricket. So where do you sit when I say to you, would you rather be coming in off good form in a completely different standard style of cricket? Would you rather be Virat and Shubman Gill coming off a million runs in the IPL, knowing your bowlers have been bowling their guts out in a different style of the game, but might be a little bit tired? Or would you rather come in with Cummins, Stark, Bolan, slash Hazelwood, Lyon, your bowlers, not having played any cricket, but come in fully fresh and ready to go? Like... What do you want? Do you want your T20 experience with some tiredness factor or do you want completely fresh but I haven't been playing any cricket? That's a good question, mm. isn't it? Like Because the uh, the upside, I think, is Manus and Steve Smith have been playing proper cricket. Yes. Like well, they've been playing test cricket, yep. right? So I think that if we're looking at advantages versus disadvantages, I'm going to – let's break it down. I think that's an advantage. They're playing long-form cricket – they're in the country in which this game is going to be played. I think that's a that's an upside. That's a positive that maybe puts our some of our batting in front of their batting because it is a different style of batting. You can't just translate completely the same. Oh, fuck me. Um, you'd I think you'd want the others to be playing more cricket though. That's the 
thing that worries me. I like the idea that we're going to be fresh, but the idea that like a lot of our bowlers haven't been playing cricket at all. Although we've played India a lot recently. So like it's not like we're going into a game against a team that we don't know. Like, I mean, we spent a lot of time playing India not that long ago. It was only a few months ago. So like it's fresh in our minds. So oh, fuck. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think? What which of those do you think is the more compelling story? Uh, I I think I think cricket. I think any cricket you're playing for your batsmen, your bowlers. See, I'm going half a dozen to one sixty. I think I want my bowlers rested like ours have been. I think I want my top order to have been playing cricket like theirs have been. I want to be Shubman Gill coming off 300s. I want to be Coley coming off 200s. I want to be Pajara playing in England rather than being Uzi and Head not playing much cricket. But that that's just me. I, mm. can, can, I, can I play one more game with you while we're going in deep analysis? Yeah. All right. I'm going to read out each player, right? And I want you to pick who you're picking, right? So I'm going to go down the teams. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. So are you – in your team, are you picking – Warner or Rohit Sharma? Sharma. Okay. So there's one to India. Are you picking yeah. Kawaja, my favourite Australian cricketer currently, or Shubman Gill? Yeah, at the moment, Kawaja. One all. Are you picking Manus, the number one ranked T20 bat, uh, test batsman in the world, or Cheteshwar Pajara, who just seems to go to another level against Australia? <laughs> That is a very tough one. Like Manus six months ago, I would have definitely said Manus just because he was in such unstoppable form. It feels like that's not quite where he's at now. But I'm just based on what we just said before. He's playing long-form cricket in that country. I'm going to pick Manus. Now this, this is a question I can't answer, but you are going to have to. Are you picking at number four, Steve Smith or Virat Kohli? OMG, Will. Now, this is a man from Hayfield who I've seen, I've played cricket with, absolutely not qualified to answer this question, but you're going to have to. Are you going for Steve Smith <laughs> or Virat Kohli? I mean, again, <laughs> how many people do you think uh, – how many people do you think are going to listen to this podcast in India? <laughs> if I put it on my because... socials, Will, a lot more than you will expect. Trust me. I mean – I, well, because, I mean, hey, they have stand-up in India as well. Yep. I'd love to crack into the there Indian market. There we go. It's a big um, market. <laughs> you notice I'm asking you these questions so you can answer them rather than me? <laughs> no, fair enough. Um, I – and this is this would be my Australian bias coming in because, honestly, you can't pick between the two of them. You'd be very happy with either of them is the answer to that question. But – just because of what Steve Smith did last time he was in England, the fact that he's there preparing for it now, and I still think that, yeah, I reckon Smith's got something to prove. And I would say if you were just tossing the – I'm an Australian also, by the way, so I think I'm going to pick Smith here, yeah. Anderson leaves out Coley in the Hindustan Times tomorrow. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Righto. Travis Head or Ajinka Rahane, a man that Captain India when Coley uh, had to go home from Australia, started the IPL like nothing we've ever seen, Rahane, or Trav Head, who he could be the deciding factor in both these series, let's be honest. If Trav yeah, Head gets head. going, he can do anything. You're going Head, are you? Head for me. Righto. Yep. So is it reasonably – Aussies are doing okay so yeah, far. Yeah, so there's this a reasonably is, clear yeah. picture developing. I'll, I'll tally him up mm. for you. Okay. Cam Green – who I said I think can dominate the series and the test match, um, versus Jadeja, the man I told you that is many ways the talisman of Indian cricket. <laughs> like again, that mate, that's a yeah. that's a oh, that's a tough uh, that that's what mm, that's as hard as the previous one. I here's think. what I will. Here's what I'm. Yeah, I was going to say. Here's what I will say to you. None of these have been easy. No. Like I've been looking for an easy one. <laughs> like I've been looking for one where I'm like, it's clearly that way, and I really haven't found a lot so far. So this has been tough. I'm going to say, with hope and with what you've said, you've actually got me to this position because I think if you'd asked me before this podcast, I might have said Jadeja. But like, 
I'm going to say based on your confidence <laughs> in this being the uh, winter of, or slash summer, depending on which hemisphere you're in, of Cameron Green, yep. I'm going to say Cameron Green. So you blame that on me. Right. So there's an interesting story developing. Yep. This is when it gets trickier. This is where um, your knowledge will be tested. you got Alex Carey, the keeper. Um, I think K.S. Barat is the man. That whether they would have kept with Rahul if he played, I don't know. Barat's only played four tests. He averages 20 with the bat. Really good gloveman versus Carey, who just loves to reverse sweep everything and he's the most upstanding Australian athlete you could ever meet. <laughs> who are you going with there? You, I, th- I presume you go with Carey Ke- just because well, you're more familiar with him. Yeah, that's right. I think that, like, I mean, I was worried about Carey when we were going to get to Carey because, you know, I do think that, like, he's – he would. I, I mean, he's an incredible, like you said, an incredible athlete. You know, was a, a top level footballer as well as being a top level cricketer, and at his best, is you know very very good. He's just not consistently at his best in the way that you'd still you, you still feel like if he could take his game to just like a slightly higher level than that what he's at. Like you know, he's not in risk of losing his place in the team or anything. But yeah, okay. I'm, I'm look. Yeah, this has been going all right for the Aussies so far. There's been a lot of line ball calls that I'm pretty much making in favour of Australia. But I'm going to say Kerry. Yeah, but yeah. Th- this will help us develop who who we're going to pick. The only other wild card. Yeah. There's another keeper in the squad. Mm-hmm. Um, that yeah. you won't have heard of, but my son told me you need to meet this guy purely on the back of his name before I went to the IPL. He opens the batting for Mumbai, and he's a wicket keeper. Hasn't played a Test match. But he's got a name that should get him a starting spot. Oh, okay. What's the, what's the name? Ishan Tendulkar. Ishan Kishan. <laughs> Ishan Kishan. He's a star. Ishan Kishan. Commentator's favourite when Ishan Kishan comes out and starts belting him <laughs> over the fence. So he's. I haven't thrown him in the mix, but but don't don't be unaware if you turn in and Ravi Shastri's at the captain's toss oh, and he says Ishan Kishan's playing his first Test match, you know Ishan who he is. Kishan. All right. Okay. So then we get oh, the bowlers. I, I, gotta, I might even I might even change my my tip for that position based on the <laughs> name if Ishan mate, Kishan he's gets. A, a, he's a great a name and he's a, he can whack the ball. So I'll take him out of batting order now. I'll go um, right. the spin option. So you got Nathan Lyon, yep. five hundred plus. I think Ravi Ashwin's. It, it, they go they go wicket for wicket. These two. Um, yeah. Ashwin has terrorised the mm. Australians over the years. Let's be honest, but not in Australia, but I in India. Agree. How does he go in England? Is is the great unanswerable. Um, Nathan Lyon will have played more Test cricket, I would imagine, in England. Um, although m- maybe not. Um, it's a tough one again. It's it's another line baller, isn't it? Like these are two, two yeah. go down as greats. Ashwin, there's a. Batting component here that yes. I think he's made four could test hundreds, the two. four test hundreds, all against yeah, the West Indies. See, Will, that's your, to your, me your average is... comedian is not pulling out. Ravi Ashwin scored four <laughs> test hundreds, so I might get a run at it. Maybe a third Ashes test. I think I should. I'm a bit like David Warner. I think power performance should get me another start here. Oh, mate, I'm happy to have you back. I just know once we get into the middle of it, you have a lot of actual yes. you know, paid commitments yeah, in this field. Is there no pay here? I've given you a lot of good gear. No. So, mate, are you going Ashwin I mean, or Lyon? If we, mate, I'll, I'll pay you on a percentage of Indian downloads. <laughs> right, no, so, I can do something about that. So what yeah. do you reckon, Lyon? When we get the in, when we, I'm going to say Ashwin. Okay. I would pick Ashwin, and that is no disrespect nope. to the great uh, Nathan Lyon. No, it's but a tough one. if it's head to head for the batting alone, I think they're both probably equally as good a bowlers. Uh, yeah, maybe Lyon slightly in front, but Ashwin just for the batting. Now I'll, I'll try and I'll try and line the bowlers up in, mm-hmm. yeah, as to where the world probably thinks they fit in the yes, standard bowling okay. out of order. So, All as right. I said, I think Boland over Hazelwood just due to injury, but it could be Hazelwood. But let's, let's for instance, go Boland, Boland versus Mohamed Siraj. Very good bowler. Scotty's played seven tests, hasn't played a test match in England. Looks like the type of bowler that could Who be... Who would do very well there, uh, but we don't know. No, we don't right? know. It's like just one of those things until... I mean, I love Scotty Boland and it would be hard not to pick him, but you'd almost like, I don't know, like it, this, mm, 
I want. I need to keep. I, 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 you know what I'm also doing? What? I'm aware of the fact that I'm going to want to pick a couple of the other Australian bowlers, okay. and I, I, I feel like this might be my one where I'm taking a knee. Right so on. I'm going to say, yeah, I, you know what? Sorry, Scotty, but I feel like. I feel like Siraj is going to get this. In exciting news for the Howie Games, one of mm-hmm. Mohamed Siraj or Scotty Boland are coming up very soon on the show. I'm not going to tell you which one oh. it is, but it's either okay. Siraj or Boland. I'll let you, your audience try and figure one, out. One, one of them will be much better for your download. That's so. right. That's right. <laughs> one of them will be easier to get hold of, though, Will. And those two might not be might be in the same pie chart. Okay. Now it's getting interesting now. Um, uh-huh. I, I The nicest – you know, I say this about too many, but just if not the one of the nicest athletes I've ever met, Mitchell Stark, he is just a beautiful, beautiful man. He's up against Umesh Yadav. I mean, I think that – I think you've got to pick Stark just for the absolute strike power yep. that he brings to the table. I agree. And in a game like this – you need somebody who has that capacity in what it is that they do. So, yeah, I would say, I would say Stark, yes. Now what would traditionally be called the leaders of both attacks, mm, I think. It's yes. not, we're not judging them at this position, but I think that's if you're writing an article, you're saying yes. the leaders of the both the attacks, the captain mm-hmm. of Australia, Patrick Cummins, and the man that yes. has been incredible for the last five years in all forms of the game, Mohamed Shami, he of the upright yes. seam. Mm-hmm. I mean, that seam. Mm. It's hard to go past that it, seam. It presents. It's a well-presented seam. <laughs> well-presented seam and he's good in dry and wet conditions. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, KOK. Okay. That's but right. I – oh, man. Like, I mean, you'd be happy to have either to choose from, wouldn't yes. you? Like, I mean, if that was your schoolyard yep. pick. I mean, I, I need a captain for this team at this point. Like, I – I oh, know Rowett's playing. Rowett could captain the team. Steve Smith could captain, I suppose, if I was going to actually put together a team. Um, I mean, I think that after what happened in India and the challenges that he's been going through, I feel like, you know, we were talking before about what who's the player who's going to make the Ashes their own or make this like there's, – there's a real chance that could also be Paddy Cummins for me. I feel like – I feel like Cummins by the smallest – of margins because I don't know if you've seen Pat Cummins and seam uh, as well, Howie, but it's pretty upright. That man can bowl a pretty upright seam as well, you know? Like, Everything like, is upright I'm, about I've been Patty. looking at his seam. <laughs> it's pretty upright. He's got good when it seam. comes to upright seams, upright citizens, upright presentation, yep. Patty is your guy. So this is you, mate. This is you. I'm holding mm. it up to you. You've got eight Australians in your team. You've got three Indians. So I'll answer your question shortly. But your answer can only be you think Australia will win this test match purely on the selections you've made. You can't you can't give me anything else. I mean, yeah, I guess. Well, I, I always thought that I thought that, to be honest. I've always, I always think Australia will win every. I thought they were going to win in India. Well, that I was, was a wrong, bloody long winded but... exercise then. <laughs> if you were just going to say India, you could have just said India. We could have saved them 20 minutes of the trip to bloody work or school for him. No, I like, I like, like, that was a really good way to do it because honestly, going into this, I, I think India are a better team than us. Like, it feels like. You know, that I just feel like more consistently knowing how to win, like in that moment, I feel like India is better. But when you go down, you know, like player by player and stand them side by side, clearly I've got a lot of Australian bias. Like, you know, that's I'm more interested in the Australians. But it does feel like we do match up pretty yep. well. I I think I think it'll be a fantastic test match. I can't wait to watch it, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to dress it up too much. For me, I think there's more likelihood of Australia's quicks getting early Indian wickets than there is of India's quicks getting early Australian wickets. I could be horribly wrong, but if I had to give you my thoughts, I think the Australian pace attack as a unit, just the pace attack, has a slight edge, and if you get one of those overcast England days and there's been some covers on and there's a bit of spice in the pitch, I think our attack has got a greater percentage opportunity of exploiting that than India's in a fine run thing. So for that reason, 
I think Australia on the back of the bowling. But to anyone listening in India, you're all bloody legends and I love you all and I think you've yeah, got a great test you. team. Yes. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. If, if we get uh, – t- to be honest, if there's more Indian downloads <laughs> of this podcast than there are Australian downloads of the podcast – I'm happy to record another one where I flip flop on all that. Can we do? I am can willing we do to sell out to the great nation of India. Can we do that, mate? Where we've got <laughs> geo blocked, yeah. and in Australia we say Australia, yeah. and in India it comes out that we're picking India. The only problem with that is how many Indian Australians well, there are, of course, true. who that's would be listening in Australia. And so, there's more probably Indian sure. Australians than Australian Indians, to be fair. Um, yeah, but it's it's it, it's a fine run. It's a fine. Run thing, isn't it? And um, I, I hope everyone listening gains an understanding of the passion and lack of expertise Will and I have on this subject. But it's just bloody – I don't know how long we've been talking for, but it's just bloody good to talk about cricket. And the fact we're going to be able to watch this and talk about it and then into the ashes fills me with a great deal of joy, Will. And, and I can watch it all and somehow make it tax deductible. <laughs> I mean – you absolutely can do that, and I think I'm on my way to being able to do that. This so show, I think we've, hello so the I ATO. You this show means you watching it and getting your whatever, the, the, wherever you're watching it, your KO minis, you, you're good there. Uh, okay, so uh, here's what I'm going to uh, quickly ask you. Uh, so it would be lovely, I mean, if we can find some time, it would be lovely to check back in during the Ashes because, I mean, so much – yeah, this is – I really did want to talk about the World Test Championship because I am super excited about that, but – the hope is that Australia wins that and then we get the opportunity to go into a five-match series against the other relevant challenger for the best team in world cricket. Because I think at the moment the best three teams in world cricket are England, India and Australia. Like, And so like, it would be ideal to me if Australia win that you know, against India, then they come in as the champions to go into a five-test series against the next most likely team, this team that is playing this, the new version of Test cricket. I mean, India can play a little bit of the that style of cricket, but they're also famously, you know, they'll produce a Test match cricketer who's a wall. You know, that is part of the. Whereas the England approach now is very much the the big bash league, baseball as they're calling it, style of Test match cricket. We're about to see how it goes against the Australians, what sort of pitches that they come up with. It's super enticing, super exciting. Let's not go into it in any great depth because we've been talking for ages, but do you have just like what what do you think's gonna happen? Do you have any like do you do you think that like this style of England playing is sustainable? They seem to have a lot of really great batsmen. Their bowlers seem to be a bit all over the place with injuries, and we don't really know until we get there what that's gonna be like. But their batting seems very, very good and very, very strong, and they obviously believe in themselves very well. What what what's your thoughts going into this Ashes series series just as a, a little preview? Well, we could line up each team and get you to pick again, but it's hard to know. Uh, I think I love everything about Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullum, and I love what they are doing to revitalise the game that we both love and make it relevant in 2023. Um, So a part of me, only a small part of me, hopes that they just turn it on and that they dominate because it will reinforce that Test Cricket can adapt and change as it has for 150 years and be relevant in 2023. Um, yeah, you definitely hope that, like, it might be, you know, I mean, because you can see Cameron Green, Travis Head, these sort of players, even David Warner, if David Warner has a good series for the Australians, like, that if they, if the English play well and the Australians play well, it oh. would clearly be great for Test cricket. Yes. Because you know if they both play well, the cricket that we see is going to be so exciting to watch. Yeah. I I, I look at England. Um, if they both can pick their best 11, oh, I can't pick a winner. I can't. If they've both got their fit 11, their preferred 11 on the ground, I can't pick a winner, Will. Um, I, I might even... And because you can't pick a winner, it's so hard to win away from home, y- 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 your brain has to overrule your heart and you have to say England because they're in home conditions. If, if it's that tight in your mind, you have to pick the home side. But I just 
obviously Jimmy Anderson's got an issue. He's not. I don't think he's playing against Ireland. Um, but they say he'll be right. I, I don't know what happened to Ollie I Robinson. Think, I think he's out with uh, being 150 years yeah. old. Yes. I think is what's going on with Jimmy <laughs> Anderson. Like, of course he's got a fucking issue. He's <laughs> like, he's the same age as the coach of the team. Right. Like, of course, occasionally he gets a bit sore. Yeah. So, it, does Jimmy? How many tests does Jimmy play? I hope the lot because he's one of my favourite guests that he's that has been on the podcast, and I, he's he's a lovely fellow. Um, I'm hoping to get Stuart Broad on the podcast next week, actually, um, which um, I'm fascinated to talk to because again, he's one of those blokes that you have a perception that he's completely different too. He's the the brief interactions I've had with him. He's such a nice man, but I, I don't know what's up with Ollie Robinson. I, I I read that he was injured in that game that he was playing with Steve Smith. So I I, I presume he'd be right, but there's injury concerns. And I saw Ben Stokes limping around the IPL, um, not playing as he's trying to overcome a knee. So Hopefully Anderson plays. Hopefully Robinson's good to go. And hopefully Stokes can bat and bowl. But there's a few hopefullys in there, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, that's Australia's best chance, though, I think, is a few hopefullys. Because I think if they're – I'm with you. If they're at full strength and we're at full strength, I worry that they're better than us, unfortunately. Because they are good. (laughs) They're really, really good. In in home conditions, like you you put these tests in Australia, yeah. I'm picking Australia every day of the week. So that I, oh, I think yeah. therefore you have to pick England. But I'd be as an England supporter, I'd be nervous about the injuries coming. I'd be nervous as Australian about um, Hazelwood as well. hasn't played much Test cricket in the last year and a half. I hope he's good to go. So if if you had to push me, I think injuries, if they come into the England squad, will give Australia the the upper hand. Just, but geez, I hope it's like 2005, mate, with KP and Vaughny and Warney and Punter. Like, if we get one of those series that just just lights up Test cricket for the next generation again, then I, it, I'd rather a cracking series than an Australian win. I'd rather you said to me, it's 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 a 2005 series, but I can't tell you who's going to win. I would choose that as a cricket fan over an Australian oh, win. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, the ideal scenario is like, I mean, not ideal because I always would love to see us win. But if we lost 3-2 in the fifth test, like that's good for test cricket. You know, like you yeah. know that that will have been su- – and I can see that. I can see with these two teams it really be – like a split series in like a 3-2 result. Like unless, like you said, something really seriously goes wrong and, you know, one team obviously – like, I mean, the bowlers, I think, both teams have got great batsmen. Like it's going to be which bowlers are fit enough and which bowlers can stand up for an entire yeah. series or which mix of bowlers. Yep. Like Because like, it feels like it's not going to be one of those series where you just take the same bowling lineup into five tests in a row. It feels like it's going to be won by a squad of bowlers – on one side or the other. So do you reckon? Uh, do, you, do, you, do you reckon oh, yeah. um, everything about watching Scotty Boland? Uh, um, when I talked to him a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, he, he he's only played in England in 2018 as part of the 150 year celebrations of the first Indigenous team, um, the first Australian sporting team to ever play overseas. So he's he's only played in England um, in that back in 2018, and I read a few of the articles around it and it stuck in my head as a much lower standard of cricket. We're not talking test cricket here where they're t- playing the counties and various teams. It was a wonderful tour. There was various times it was written, dot, 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 and Scott Boland was nearly unplayable. And yeah. everything I've seen about Scott Boland – on on a on a wicket that assists yes. Anderson and Broad, it can assist Scotty Bowl. I I I hope he gets an opportunity because be I so I good. think he could just nibble away another statue building operation like that. He could produce that again. I know. I I feel that too. Like I feel like he could be incredible over there. I really do hope because he yeah. It just does feel like it's going to suit that style of bowler who just like can put it on the same spot over and over and over again relentlessly. So I hope so too. Like I would love to see Scotty Boland. If we came back and Scotty Boland was the hero yeah. of this tour, Terry Alderman style, oh, you know, yes, Terry. it would just be. <laughs> I want my hero to be. Uh, yeah. I want my hero to be Usman Kawaja. If I want to choose a hero, on, let's yeah. let's finish this. If I want to choose a hero on. Either Great. side in the World Test Championship, I want Usman to be my Australian hero and I want um, 
It's your Deja to be my Indian hero. Okay. All right. And who's your English hero if uh, we, we just go there on one There can be only one. Further. The Stoker. The Stoker. I, yeah. I just think he's a bloody superstar, the Stoker. And he's held together by a tape like the old Bruce Rude snapped in half. But I, <laughs> he's, the Stoker's my man there. Uh, Mark Howard, uh, you can, can of course catch the Howie Games, uh, the very successful uh, podcast. You can listen to interviews with a whole bunch of the people that we've actually talked about today, plus uh, brilliant sports people from all over the world. So, uh, Howie, it's been an absolute pleasure for you, uh, to have you on the very first episode of whatever this is. It's got me super excited about it all. Um, and, you know, uh, I hope that people listening to this are also excited about And I hope we get to see, you know, a really exciting two months of cricket. I, it could, it's poised to be some of the best cricket that uh, we've seen in a very long time. So I hope it actually works out like that. Mate, I've loved being on. I was excited about it when you said, oh, I don't know if you've got time. I was like, oh, I'm making time for this. I've loved chatting cricket with you. And for everyone listening in India, if you haven't liked the end of the result, <laughs> stick to Will's <laughs> podcast because there will be an addendum yes. where we are picking yeah. India to win in two days. So keep an ear out for that one as well. If there's more Indian downloads than Australian, I'm willing to flip-flop. Good on you, mate. Loved it. Listener.